information center for the environment here at UC Davis and a professor of the environment science and policy. Um, yeah, our group represents the environmental, uh, the geographic, and it has become increasingly interesting in conspiracy to uh, apply ontological thinking to uh, synthesis across the this is a great from global um, uh, impacts of large, large scale agriculture. Um, prompted, I'm not told by uh, Errol Schmidt, who couldn't join us this morning, and Mount Lynch, uh, the Agricultural Sustainability Institute, uh, through uh, the actual you know, nutrition and health consequences that uh, Matt Lang represents. And um, so the Information infrastructure, collaboration with the library and our sciences initiative. So it's been an exciting time on campus to use ontological thinking to sort of collect thoughts together, real work together over a range of you know, issues that are found at the universities tend to be multiple departments and groups who never either talk to one another or use different languages that need to be integrated. So, um, I'll be part of the conceptual side of this. You know, this actually takes tools to you know, build these uh, ontological languages and to uh, be able to see what we're doing. And I'm delighted over lunch to have uh, John Sotsman, who is the uh, purveyor and chief enthusiast for one of our favorite sets of tools, which is the labor act. This is a front um, ink. Uh, which we are, in fact, trying to use to get this common collaboration building. Um, yes, uh, started out as a cognitive experiment as a psychologist, uh, working from, with interesting software policy in the early days. He was on the faculty at um, the University of Technology and has been a CEO and chief proselytizer for uh, uh, Fox for some years now. He's also been uh, a communicational advisor and an important source of ideas for us, um, and one of the you know, several interesting industry collaborators that we have been uh, trying to develop on this project along with that history, uh, represented by Susanna Crespo and back also Google, Microsoft, and, uh, Mike and others. So this has been quite an eye-opening for those of us but so anyway, what we're going to dedicate much to is to do certain actual rules and we're act we're really enthusiastic about Next year. Can you guys hear me okay? Yep. Mm -hmm. All right, okay. So yeah, I make uh, a living of uh, helping well selling tools and helping people with ontologies, technologies. Big graph databases, data analytics, on top of graphs, and I'm going to talk about that today a little bit. So, um, our company has been around now for 32 years, from here from Oakland, about 40 people. We were always in the compiler business for the last 10 years. We've been totally focused on semantic graph databases, and our product is called the Lego Graph. You speak to the mic a little bit more. Okay. Move okay. there, uh, hands. Okay. Okay, so when we started out 10 years ago, it was mostly the intelligence agencies, the DOD, that saw the uh, effect of moving up networks of people and, and, and uh, companies and places and find connections between them. Uh, and each of these, which you see here, is actually using graph technology. But for the last five years, we've been a more focused in the commercial domain. And all the big life science uh, pharmaceutical companies use uh, uh, triple stores, graph databases, because they have really the most complicated data in the world. Um, and banks are beginning to use it, but our biggest project in our company right now is a, a project where we try to take every, all the data, everything that you can find out about a population and put it in one big database. And that is our biggest project, and I'm going to talk about it because I think it's an example of what you guys also go to face. Uh, so, a little history. Um, 
is that this is what I would call the history of computing, because I think if you guys want to do what I can you talk about this morning, that you want to build a cognitive computing platform for agriculture, for food, for, for all of these topics. Ten years ago, we just had we just had a structured day like that. We would do some data science on top. Then an output of the data science would go into reports or it would go to people, and that was it. And then about seven years ago, people started to realize that most of the important information in the company is not in your structured database, but in everything else, in the logs, in the emails, and if I think about agriculture, it costs a lot of other things. So people started developing natural language processing to get elements out of text, but we also started having key value stores and big data. Then four or five years ago, people really seriously started talking about adding knowledge to their uh, databases in the form of vocabularies, taxonomies, cohorts, uh, and the that. I mean, 10 years ago, when I talked to Peter Norfolk at Google, and I said, so what are you guys going to do with select technology? He said, I don't know enough for us. I mean, we can do everything with a lot of data. It turned around, of course, now that Google has this big knowledge graph that they started developing around four or five years ago. They have Watson, um, which is all about the big total data that you can find anywhere, plus terminologies, et cetera. Et cetera. And then what we see in the last two years is that people do data analytics on their data. But no longer does it go just to reports, but it actually will go back in the database. Yeah? So you create learning systems. You, you say you do a cluster analytics on your patients. In our case, then you put the data to one patient that cluster belongs back in the database. Now you can do additional analytics where you say, well, patients with diabetes in this cluster, how do you respond to this particular medication? So systems turn into learning systems. And then on top, on top of all of this, if you want to do this, no way in hell you can do this in a straight key value store or you can do this in a structured database. What you really see is people start starting to use massive, massively large distributed graph databases. Yeah? Where you can take all the data in one format and then you have to on top. And this is what I call cognitive computing. And the one thing I see happening in the next several years is that the Internet of Things is going to have this. Yes, also, sensor data is going to get into this infrastructure. So, the challenge that we face, that we face every day in healthcare, is you guys have many types of data coming in from multiple sources in multiple formats. Then you have to start a great number of terminologies and ontology systems. You know, this part of the life science, by the way, yeah, but you're getting there. And the problem is, they're all a little bit different. So how do you wrap them together in a meaningful way? We've dealt with that and I'll talk about it later. And then you've all that data. So first is how you transform it so you can easily uh, communicate about it, analyze it, but also how do you get the data that up to your terminology systems? So that's the big one. Then how do you put it all in a big data infrastructure? How do you do that analytics on top? And how do you feed that results of the analytics back in your database so that you or other people can do further analytics. So I'm going to talk about all that. First about graphs. Anyone here has worked with uh, actively worked with the graph database? That's about 10 percent Okay. Then just for fun, I'll do a little bit of a demo of a semantic graph database. So first about graphs, everyone knows what the graph is something like there's notes and notes attributes like my this person who made notes as well, H, who lives in another thing that has multiple properties, which is a part of a state with the name California, uh, which is part of the country, which is the USA. Yes. And it might be another person that was from uh, New Yorkers in New York, yeah, which is also part of the USA. So the graph gets bigger. And say I had a meeting, there was a meeting between these two people. Yeah. And now we have an even bigger graph. Yeah, so this is the basic thing, nodes, links between nodes. Um, and you store it, at least we store it in a computer just as one big table. Here yeah, we have the first node, the thing that links the nodes together, and then the last part of the nodes. So yeah, we call these things triples. Okay, so that is basically what you have in a semantic graph database. And then, very important, I just made it very simple for you, but each of these subjects actually has a 
namespace, the URL for follow us. And I'll show it in a minute. Okay, so the demo that I'm going to do, I downloaded five of these um, terminology systems and data sets from the linked open data cloud. Yeah, so just things that you can download from the web. Don't know if you ever tried it, but oh yeah, well, sorry. So what I'm going to do for my demo, I took a database with 4,000 side effects, uh, 4,000 diseases, 1,800 FDA approved uh, small molecules, 100,000 clinical trials sponsored by the FDA, and about 10,000 brand names. And you see the links so of each of the servers here, by the way, is a few million, two million, two million, billions of these triples that I just showed you. And the little lines between them mean that two sources of data use the same word for the same thing. So if you load them all in one graph database, they're instantly integrated. So just for fun, if you want to look at one of these circles, Okay, you can just do this on the web. Um, download Cider RDF. And you go to the website. And somewhere you will find uh, this part of the endpoint where you can go to, or you just do a dump. Download endpoint zip. You download it and you can load it in the database. And then the triples that you have. I'm also going to show you just as a general education for this morning. This is a database of diseases I downloaded from the web. Yeah, so here you see, say you want to look something with liver, kidney. Then here you see the triples that I just talked about. This is the first part. Disease number 912, which is a standard naming convention for diseases. And then this one had a oh, this, this very interesting one. Let me do another one. Can you this uh, okay, So this disease 415 has the name, and that's something I can't pronounce. Yeah. Um, and this disease also has a degree two. Particular size, class three, etc. etc. Et so this is the information just downloaded from the phone web. And so now I just look like when you look at these data sets. So we have a tool that you see here. This little thing, it's called Graph. It's free download from the web. Um, if you later want to play with this, the data set that I'm going to show you is even on the website, you can download and play with it. This is the database that I just, where I have these five data sets and I link them together. So now I can look for any disease that you're interested in, or maybe any food, any food drug or disease you're interested in. There's not so much food in here, potato probably. No. Bread? Yes, there's bread. <laughs> okay, so. I find five clinical trials that have the word red somewhere in there. And I can look at all those clinical trials. I double click, and here you see the, the first note of this clinical trial is the brief title Sync Supplementation in Cholera Patients. In cholera patients. And this um, clinical trial discusses these decreases, these drugs, these side effects. Now, I, I told you everything here is this URL, so I can hit the button here. You see something terrible. Yeah, these unreadable numbers of diseases. Fortunately, the modern tools, not just ours, show things by their label. Um, usually, there will be one triple that says that this disease 164 has the label. Uh, so I can now click on, say, potassium, and I get, I jump from the clinical disease database, clinical trial database, sorry, into the drug database. And here we have all the metadata about potassium. Uh, we see uh, the, well, there's not much of a chemical formula here. <laughs> the drug type, the enzymes it works on, the mechanism of action. And here, this thing for line means that everything above starts with potassium, every triple below ends. So this means that this clinical trial discusses drugs with potassium. Yeah, and I can go to another clinical trial, and I can go to 
say, a particular disease, hypertension. And then I'm in hypertension, I see associated genes. So I could go to click on this and go to the gene ontology. If I had that, I'd more information there. I can look at the potential drugs that might help with this, etc. So let me go back to the graph screen. So you saw the things that I looked at, looked at. And I can also explore the graph the screen if I wanted to. I can click here and say, so what are the side effects of the targets? Diabetes, DNA, insulin. And here are the, I can do all these diseases. So there were a few of them. And these things are still unrelated. So what I can do is I can select some predicates here. Actually, I've done it already. I say I want to explore the graph on the screen, but I don't want to look at disease, drug side effects, and targets that link things together. So I do that, and I say, so how does this clinical trial that talks about red connects to this guy here? It says, oh, I can't find the direct link, but there are a number of longer steps. And then this diabetes hypertension, arrhythmia, maybe something else that's interesting here, potassium. So I find a link, and now everything is linked together. And if I don't like this particular format, this, and I can show it as a graph on the screen. Now I can take any other topic and link it to, I can take any disease, any drug, any gene, whatever you have, ask for it, and link it to all. So if there's any other words that you're interested in. OK, so then I'll do my experiment about romantic kissing. There's one clinical trial that says uh, effects are well, effects of romantic affection on blood chemistry in the young relatives. Yeah, this is a study by the FDA. <laughs> no clue how expensive this one was. <laughs> and I can ask, how is it relate to say a clinical trial about well, I don't know where the brand was here. And there's always a way to go from any clinical trial. This is about diabetes, you get insulin. Yeah, so I can keep going. Now if, so I see, I can find patterns, I can link everything to everything, but sometimes you want to know how many times is C reactive protein linked to a trial, a, a trial to diabetes to say um, insulin in that links. I can then do just this, I can say, okay, let me connect this, and this, and this, and this, and this. And let's put it in a graphical query view. Yeah, so I just selected a little part of the graph. And then I can say, okay, I want to make this variables, because these are now constants. So I can turn them into uh, variables. And the query says, give me a trial that talks about insulin, insulin and then any other side effect. And this the trial will talk about that side effect, and it will talk, talk about c protein. So then when I run the query, this system automatically creates a Sparkle query, so you don't have to write the Sparkle query yourself. Yeah? And gives you the results if you want, so you can look at the results of your query as a graph. So, um, and then I can keep going with this and say, so well, I don't know everything else that I can find out about this clinical trial. Everything else. Say, I, well, no, let me say, really everything else. And if I try to link, link, not very. Yeah, and now I get lots of other like start dates where the, the clinical trial was done. Uh, I mean, this is a complete nonsense query, but you get my point. Yeah. All right, so um, um, that's, that's it for now. So, so you now get the idea of a graph database, why this is a semantic graph database, because everything is URLs, how you find, can find connections, and how you display it. So let me now continue with my story. So here we are. So about three years ago, we started with the semantic data link for healthcare. And for marketing purposes, we're going to call it a computer computer platform for healthcare. Um, and we get help from Cloudera, uh, Cisco, and Intel. 
that gave us a whole bunch of machinery for us to, for a cluster for us to work on. And then we worked together with the hospital chain, the eighth biggest hospital chain in the United States, uh, which is very right rough if you don't live in New York. It's called uh, Multifure. It's got about 2.7 million patients. Uh, and they have, I think, uh, almost like 160 different nationalities. They have more nationalities than any other hospital in the United States. And if anyone in the United States wants to do research on a particular kind of weird, rare tropical disease, they will ask what to cure if they have some patients that have that disease. Yeah, so we have that data. So we have, well, so we work with this 2.7 million patients, 10 years of data. And what we wanted to build is a platform that can do all these kinds of analytics. We want to do personalized medicine. And that is someone this morning talked about it. And that means for a hospital that every patient is different. And for this one particular patient, what is the best treatment that you can do? Well, um, they need a lot of data. Predict, uh, predictive modeling, of course, you can imagine. If my patient has this, this, what is most likely going to happen to this patient in the future? And I'm really not going to go into all things. Business intelligence is important because hospitals have such hard time to figure out where they make money and where they lose money. And it's part of the cost of healthcare. And so um, what we're working on is to find out, can I find for any treatment, for any pill, for any clinical workflow, for any doctor or any department, can I figure out which ones we make money on, which we lose money on, and why? So a lot of things, but that is the problem for every hospital, big hospital, is that you can go to 10 startups for every box. And you can also go to 10 really big companies like IBM uh, or, or any of the other ones that will say that they're the best in the world to do the kind of analytics. And they might. But the problem is if you hire them, 90% of all the money that you spend goes to massaging the data. So what we did in our platform is take all the work away and make one big semantic platform. All the data is ready so that we can now ask vendors to come in and actually do the kind of analytics that you need directly on top of the data that, that we prepared. So what kind of data do we have? Um, sorry. Yeah, so you have a regular patient, yeah, and that generates, that guy generates an enormous amount of data. We have patients in the database, so 10 million triplets, just one patient. Because nowadays, when you send a patient home, you absolutely don't want to see it back in within 30 days, otherwise you are responsible for whatever you are at cost. So what you do is you give them an iPad and you ask every day questions. Did you take your pills? Yeah. Um, how do you feel? Do we need to see, send a, a nurse just to make sure that they're taken care of? Um, then of course they have the Fitbits and we know they're the genetic makeup. That's the day that we have the family tree. Things are even planted in the patient to generate data. There's this big epic hospital system with all the electronic medical records that generates a lot of data. Uh, ICU, it's, it's, it's a whole internet of things in itself where you have more than 50 sources of well, high speed data coming at you. Um, there's the tests, there is the analog data, there's the image data. Pharmaceutical data, sorry, pharmacological data. Anyway, I don't need to go all of this. You can just imagine this as really, a really a lot of data. Thank you, Marcus. So we created a platform to take it all in, and we're still working on Not all of what I just showed is already in there, but we're working on it. And so what we're trying to build is this, and what we have achieved for most part is this very high level mature analytics platform. Yeah? They can do all the things that you see here. And like everyone starts out, yeah, is in every hospital, is you literally have hundreds of uh, siloed databases to keep your operations running. Each of these databases is important. The one problem is that none of these databases talk to each other. And I can tell you that when you're a database designer, there's not a single neural in your head thinking about how is my database going to work with your database. It just no one teaches that to the database makers. Yeah? It just happens. Nowadays, when people talk about mass data management, there's a little bit of a movement there, but most people, you just want to solve a problem, so you make a database schema. Now, because that's so hard to analyze on hundreds of databases, people spend a lot of money 
and I'd say $100 million to get this actually off the far door to create an enterprise data warehouse yeah, by uh, an exit platform from Oracle for at least $10 million. And then you hire a whole group of programmers, database people, and you start moving data from this individual database to enterprise data warehouse. The problem is, now you have to speak one big database with, in our case, 4,000 different tables and more than 10,000 different columns. So doing analytics for that is next to impossible. So here's the things that we did. The first thing is we created a radically very, very simple schema. We took everything that could happen to a patient, whether it's a check-in, check-out, test, diagnosis, procedure, medication, administration, and made it into an object. So we have only well, we have the person is an object, and then everything else, everything else is an event. So if the address of the patient is an event because that changes. Um, the name, people change names. Um, so, yeah, so we have this ontology of super, super titles, event, and then we have sub events. And of course, you still have to know about three, four hundred different types of events. It's become much more simple to deal with. And then, because people in life sciences and, and uh, uh, medical world of uh, naming sequence terminologies, they created at least 180 different ones. Yeah. So there's 180 life science uh, terminology systems and ontologies that you can download from bioontology.org and from many other different places. We took all of those and we linked them together. So we used various algorithms so that if someone uses a word that's close to this, they might be the same, they would be related. We made sure that we keep the provenance for all these different ontologies, because as you don't know, the triples actually have four elements. The fourth element is what we call the context, which tells you, in most cases, where the triple comes from. And then the other problem is every terminology system, and you have the same in your food industry, is, deals differently with how you go up and down the terminology system. Sometimes you use broader and narrower. Sometimes you use subclass. Yes, sometimes you use the parent relationship. So what we did once we had all these other pages together, we said, okay, we're going to make one super up and down credit. We're going to call it chart. So there's only one way that this chart. So now I can start with, say, an ICD-9 code, a billing code, and link that to a matching term that goes that in various parts of the ontology I can go up. I always know in what part of the terminology system I am, but I need to write only one simple line of code to find my way up all the way to the top of the terminology. I'm going to show you in a minute. Then we wrote an ETL system. So that instead of having all these IT specialists trying to figure out how to create a, 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 a table from the Enterprise data warehouse into triples. We just have a visual screen where on the left you can point to a table in the database. Now you see all the column names of the columns there and the data type. And then on the right you have the ontology menu. Just say, okay, this field belongs to inpatient encounter and strike time. And so we just make a declarative leverage between the enterprise data warehouse and the ontology. And now another Java program reads all these mappings in and you can automatically extract the data from the data warehouse in this very simple model. Uh, and, and then people always think, okay, but how do they link the real data to all these terminology systems? So I have a picture for that. And I hope you can see it from here. Look at this. So here, you see my mouse here. On the left is straight data from the enterprise data warehouse. To the right is um, the, the terminology system. Yeah, in our case, more than 350 million terms. So you might have a person that had an outpatient encounter that started in 2009-10-08, where this outpatient encounter had a sub event, patient diagnosis, with the value of allergy to peanuts. The allergy to peanuts is then mapped to the knowledge base here. And that goes into a tree, um, sorry, a child relation to allergy to legumes, to food allergy, to allergy to substances, etc. etc. Now, the big advantage of this scheme is that I can now say, so give me all the people with food allergy. Yeah. And so, what happens is, oh, I forgot to say something. This little thing here, this gray box, gray bluish, purplish, 
is a concept, it's also an ICD-9 or a billing code. So, all the interaction between the hospital and insurance company is through or procedure codes or billing codes and drug codes. So this is a so this is kind of reality. Well, there's nothing real about ICDs, but that's another story. So you have, you have the billing codes, and then you go into knowledge land, yeah, because this is terms about knowledge. Um, but I hope you understand that if I now can say all the people with food allergy. In the terminology system, you say, okay, then let me reset that all the ways I can go back to every billing code that is ultimately a child of food allergy, and then you can find all the patients. I hope you see the power of that. Um, it's also fun to see this. Here we have allergy to peanuts, and then you see here, and this is only a few of them, we have far more. Uh, all the, the ways you spell peanut allergy, yeah, so this, these are. If any one of you know what SCOS is, yeah? so these are the old labels, the alternative labels. We have the Chinese, Korean, Dutch. Um, and so, peanut allergy, allergy, peanuts, uh, allergy to peanuts, case, that's peanuts, peanut allergy, etc. Et we use this for natural language processing. Yeah? So, we found in texts how people talk about peanut allergy, we put it back into our German store in our terminology system. So now when we analyze electronic medical records, take the doctor's notes, we have a little bit more help because we can, we, we, we already know how peanut allergy is misspelled or, or, or anyway, what the, all the, 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 the synonyms are. And that helps us greatly in then getting to the, the base concept that we actually want to use. And whatever you guys do in your work, it's also very important not only to look at the name, but also all the alternative names and make that part of your knowledge structure. Okay, uh, well, we have provenance for every trip, every, every data element. Um, let me go here. And then one query how many people did our sparkle? All right. Well. So here's the question is how many of our patients have dementia in 2010 or later? I'm just going to show you that if I want to ask that question in Sparkle, it's about six lines. Yeah? And this is one fifth of the SQL query to do the same thing. Yeah? Here it just says, was there a patient that had an encounter? Did the encounter start at a particular date? Um, and this is encounter the diagnosis that matches to a concept where this concept is ultimately the child of dementia. The little star here means go up several levels until you reach the mention. Yeah, so this is why it's so much easier to deal with our platform because we can harmonize all the data together. Um, then we link in uh, uh, other linked open data and knowledge. So for example, we have, I mean, say you, you study asthma, yeah, then it's important where you live. You need a pollen database, you need a geonave database that has all the places in the world, you need a GAS database, Weather, et cetera, et cetera. So we include it in a platform. And then, of course, you have all the other uh, things like public methods, first reaction databases, and trials, etc. So it's all part, also all part of the database and the infrastructure. Then, all of that is in our electrograph, which is nowadays distributed over tens of machines. So, it's all our information based on patient ID. So, every Every machine in our cluster runs one lecograph. Each lecograph might have eight shards of patient data. So each shard only contains a certain set of patients. And then each machine also has all the knowledge bases available. And then we do some clever thing where we federate. Well, I'm not going to talk about it. Sorry. And then on top, uh, we have data science. So we use nine. As an analytic framework on top of nine, just an open source system that makes it very easy to import modules where the input is a data frame, the output is a data frame, and then you can use whatever you want. You want to use R, you want to use uh, Spark Machine Learning, H2O, it all fits in this platform. And the important part is we feed that back in the database. Yeah, so we take all the notes goes in the graph, but even the results of machine learning go in there. Now let me show something about. Uh, this last part about the data mining on top, yeah, because it's also just going to come up in your work. 
Yeah? So we find it very, very important that the output of data science doesn't just go to, to, to papers, but actually goes back in the database so they have a trace where the data came from. Yeah? That you know who did the data, who did the data analytics, and, and what data did he use. You can start comparing analytics to other analytics. Um, anyway, you get the point, and I don't want to read that to Okay, so let me now tell you a little true story. And I'm first going to open the database here. So, um, I, I talked about it last year when I was giving the lecture here, but most people have heard the story. So, I had a friend in 2000, early 2015, gave his four year old kid his first spoon of peanut butter, and within 30 minutes, the doctor had saved the kid's life in the, in the emergency room. And yeah, this is kid in a total anaphylactic shock. So the doctor later looks at that chart of the kid and says, you know what, I could really have predicted this because this kid has dermatitis and asthma and it usually goes together with peanut allergy. So my friend tries to look at it on the internet in early 2015 and couldn't find it. And so he came to me and said, Yes, uh, you have all the data, can you see this is a known effect? Yeah. It's actually going to start our well, You're recording me. Talk about it. Streaming. Streaming. Oh, that I'm definitely going to talk, not going to talk about it. Okay, so he was interested in that. Um, he wanted to know if that was true. I said, okay, well, let me look. So I took uh, all the diagnostics for every patient on the database uh, in, 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 in a Spark. I computed the co occurrence between every diagnostic. You guys have known co occurrences? Yeah, so uh, it's like. How many times does someone have peanut allergy and uh, dermatitis? How many times does someone have peanut allergy and a broken left leg, etc., etc.? So now you make a big table. And then what you do is you look for each number and you look, given the distribution of, say, of allergy to peanuts and dermatitis, how, how often, what could I expect how often that happens together? That, in this case, would be very small. The number I see is much bigger. So we compute a thing we call the odds ratio, which basically says, well, here, for the mathematically inclined, um, maybe it's not that important to think. Okay, here. So I have this database available, and I, I, I computed all these odds ratios, and I put the odds ratios back in the database. So now I can do this. Go to the query screen. Yes, yeah, so this is, you guys can now read this because that's the previous demo. So this says, find all the odds ratio objects where the from is allergy to peanuts and the to is another, uh, in this case, ICD-9 code. The top one, basically I'm asking for the top five other things related to allergy to peanuts. And so I did this query for the first time. And when I saw this, I literally almost fell from my chair. This was 100% what the doctor said. Yeah. It's not many times in my life that you test the hypothesis and it comes out so beautiful. <laughs> this is one of the rare cases where it came out just like that. You hoped it would. And this was this says that uh, if you have a peanut allergy, then dermatitis due to food intake in internally is 210 times higher. And extrinsic asthma with acute exacerbation is 62 times higher. Yeah, and then you get another asthma, another dermatitis, and other respiratory infections. Yeah. So this is just what the doctor said. And actually, in the end of 2015, there was a big, uh, I think, a paper in Nature where they say if children, if children have asthma and dermatitis, they need to be tested for peanut allergy. So I'm very happy I did it in the beginning of 2015. Um, so here is the visualization of this query. And um, so here you have the top five of these. And my friend also wanted to know if these guys were in the cells related. So I said, okay, let me look. And 
the graph database can automatically find the shortest path between every um, between every uh, pair. So here what you see is Jim, how many how much, how many bobinas do I have? Five? Okay, easy, easy. <laughs> yeah. I'm almost done. And I can do this. I can do it again. And so what you see here is this starting with allergy to peanuts, I get kind of the statistical landscape around uh, around based on odds ratios here. So I can do it for anything else. I can do this. So this is great because when I show this to doctors, they say, oh, I kind of do that. I said, okay, that's great. So tell me then what, uh, what is most related to lack of housing. Yeah, this is the Bronx. A lot of people are homeless. So you guess what is most related to lack of housing in the Bronx? What, what billing code that the hospital sent to the opening? Oh, past due. Past due? No. Okay. Well, here's the result. A beautiful graph. If you could see graphs and tables, so let me do this. And I'd say take lack of housing. And then you see it's cocaine dependence, cocaine abuse, cocaine dependence, continuous and acute alcoholic intoxication. Yeah. <laughs> I have 40,000. I see nine codes in my database and from each of them I know the statistical landscape in many, many different ways. So, uh, oh, and then the one thing I wanted to show you, I'm going to go back, go back to the allergy to peanuts. So, these are the ICD-9 codes, but they are also linked to the terminology systems. So I could, for example, look at the mapping to the terminology system. This. Now I select the child relationship. So, and now I can say how are these things actually related in the, in the space of the terminology system? So it's going to go here. It's kind of unbeatable for a little bit. Then what you get to see is the green things are well, diseases or symptoms, poisonings. This is kind of so the blue thing here is what I call the statistical space. This is the knowledge space. Yeah, like how is the area of structure ultimately relates to to hypersensitivity, the things we want. And this one will link together accent, allergic asthma to eczema, to other dermatitis and all that. Does this make sense? Okay. Um, and then I actually want to stop here because I have a lot more to show, but there must be some questions at least. So thank you very much. Any questions? Too much? <laughs> yeah?
chemists within quite a bit of life sciences. So that's, I would say, life sciences are a shining example of how to do it. All right. Yeah. Um, a lot of this, you were talking a lot about uh, billing codes yeah. and the way billing codes interact with the rest of the data. Um, I understand that medical billing codes are standardized in the US, is that correct? Yes. And if they were not standardized in the US, would you, how, how, uh, how would you, would this system be impacted by having that intermediate step? Basically, not be not be systematized. Well, they're also using billing codes in China, same standards. It's really <laughs> all of all the world. And what people are catching up with as it starts to be ten of this. But this is the same. So we have we have these kind of crazy terminology systems. So even if a hospital was just fooling around creating their own little terminology system. Probably still easy to link up to the knowledge system itself and come up with relationships between words. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah so you gave a great example about the peanut allergy. Um, I wonder if you could um, talk about what you see the biggest challenges would be for articulating the ontology about food and nutrition and health with the existing ontology um, and system that you have for medicine and life sciences? Uh, we already have a, a food terminology system in here. Okay. Um, it's just, I mean, without other reasons, we've linked up one food. I, I tried to find it this morning, I didn't have time anymore, but there's at least one or two in there in, in our entire system. But it's, it's, it's going to be very important because food, of course, is a, is a huge uh, determinant for certain diseases or for health, actually. So it, it should be in there. And uh, whatever you guys make, they're really welcome in our platform. Because anything you can do, and, and especially if you have ingredients databases, yeah, we know things about ingredients, that we can do more data analytics start doing research for people that need this have a tendency to get that or have better health. So it's important that the food allergies are made and that they get into the system. Yeah. I'm sorry to hear about that open source your ontologies that you've developed for your medical systems. Can, can you repeat the question? You mentioned the your unified medical event ontology yeah. and the uh, unified terminology system. Yeah. Are you offering those out as an open source kind of resource or is that a proprietary? Uh, we are very seriously considering to make it open source. We're writing an article right now about the entire platform, scientific article about the entire platform. And well, our business model would be that we keep the whole thing up to date. And so, or your subscription model ought to be open source. But we're seriously thinking about it because we, that's the one question I get every lecture I give from people from the industry. And, um, it, yeah, all right. Okay. I think uh, that we're done. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Jan, for a great presentation. I'd just like to take a moment. Um,